Okay, so this is basically a, like a show and tell for mushroom finds in the greater New Jersey area for NJMA members. You know, the really greater, I see you shaking your head, Susan. <laughs> we're, we're liberal in our, uh, in our ideas of the greater New Jersey area. <laughs> um, anyway, so it's like a show and tell. So we just line up in order um, and take turns share, either sharing our screen or I can share for you if you have emailed them to me already. I have about six or seven people that email me things. So if you have stuff you would like to share tonight, please type your name into the chat box and I will call you on you in order that people have uh, volunteered to share. We ask that everyone please limit yourself to about between three and five specimens, um, share the time. There's 21 people here tonight. Um, I'm sure we'll all have time to share every, everything we want tonight. But of course, as the mushroom season progresses and we find more and more stuff, it, it's harder to try to fit everyone in. So we try to you know, take an appropriate amount of time. So I think that's everything I had to say to start with. Oh, if somebody could type the names into the chat box, that would be very helpful to everyone to be able to see the names of the mushrooms that we are talking about. So is there anybody that would like to start sharing your screen? I'm not seeing anybody yet. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I will just start sharing in the order that I received the emails, which I believe Marisol was the first one tonight. So Marisol, are you ready? Yes. All right. Yes, sir. All right. So we will start with your Pratisma species. So genus Pratisma. I went to the Pine Barrens on Saturday. Mm. And I'm always floor level ground level. So when I was turning some logs, when I saw this on a leaf, and I I have found this before, um, and there were so many leaves with it. And because it was in at the edge of a swamp, it was open, as you can see on the photo. When it is not open, it's all black, but it has some ridges. When it's wet, it reveals the fertile part that looks like some kind of dessert, some kind of jelly stuff. Um, the only thing that I know is the um, Ritisma acerina, but it doesn't seem to be, they don't accept that in iNaturalist because the host is not a maple or a poplar. This could be a Tupelo. So it's a Ritisma, but because it happens on Tupelo, I don't know which one it is. Mm. The spores are very strange and very big. They have one end is rounded and one end, end is pointy. Um, so it's an ask. Oh, I don't know if it is. Yeah, it's a do I have more photos? Mm -hmm. I did so many microscopy. Yeah, it's an ask my seat. Yeah, I, I didn't remember. It's an ask my seat, as you can see in there. So I even got the base of it, the brown part of that photo is the base of the, this little thing is, the fruiting bud is very small and not too thick. And the ascus is pointy and um, narrows towards the base, towards, towards the bottom. And I am not sure I could not count how many spores are inside. The only thing that I could see is that they are wrinkled when they are inside the ascus. And there are some paraphyses, as you can see on this photo. And I also noticed when I was doing the micro that when the spores are coming out, they are kind of strangled. I do not know. I didn't read yet about it. If there is a little opening at the end of the ascus, so the spores kind of squeeze themselves out, as you can see on the left. And then they, they get a, a more plumpy shape when they are out. Another one that is coming out and is the same, the same aspect that I saw is strangled when it's, it's coming out 
of the ASCUS. Mm -hmm. These are great pictures, Marisol. No, oh, thank you. Paraphyses are on the side. And I, on the lower ASCUS, there is one of the, the spores, the first one to come out, and it's having that weird tip. So is this cotton blue that you yeah. use, Justine? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all the pictures there. Yeah. <clears throat> Remind me again what a, the paraphresis is, is. I'm drawing a blank on that. Yeah, it's this sterile uh, part that kind of keep structure uh, and they are along the basidia. They are parallel to the basidia. They are all together the, the, uh, in the, the structure uh, of the body. Mm -hmm. Parallel to the ASCA. Yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, yeah, say Basidia. I'm so sorry. Thank you for the correction. Yes. yes. So these, right, these are the uh, things we're talking about. Paraphyses. Paraphyses. These, these lines that are kind of hard to say. I got a better picture in another one where you can see the paraphyses. Yeah, oh, there we right go. There. there we go. The middle. Yeah, yeah, that's one. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, any more questions on this one? Okay. Unknown polypore. I found this polypore very close to the, where I found this retisma, and I still don't know what it is. Um, it was hidden. Um, only one little portion, I don't even know how I saw it, just a little portion of it. And then I moved the leaves and it was bigger than what I saw first. And it was growing at the base of a dead tree. That, and I don't know what tree was that because I can't tell the tree is gone. And, but there are maples and pine trees just right there in that exact point, spot, I'm sorry. And it has some kind of pink tinge uh, to the pores. It has one to three pores per millimeter, and they look like irregular, you can see there. And um, it has an, uh, a cap that is, you can poke it with your nail. It was soft. Um, it was sonated. Can you, do I have more photos so you can show? Oh, I got the spores in water. They're kind of globose or subglobose with a drop. And, and I put it in Melzer too, and they became yellowish. I don't know too much about the reactions yet, but I'm trying. Can you show the next photo with the Meltzer? Yeah, they became yellowish. But I don't know if that means they are high alino, they are not, I have no idea. Change a little bit. Oh, the color. And I have no idea what this polypore is. It's, that's what I saw when I was down to the ground you, and then I uncovered a bigger piece. Yeah. Did you check that against heterobasidian? No, no, I, I have, I'll have to. Yeah. Because that's kind of how I often see that growing. Yeah. It, it does kind of look like that. Oh, okay, okay. That was what I was going to suggest to look oh, at. Okay, thanks. Heterobasidian, okay, cool. All right, very cool. It's going to grow more because I only took uh, one piece and there was some other parts left. Yeah. I thought it was Ganoderma, but when I saw the spores, I said, no Ganoderma. All right. Okay, thanks. Aha, your next one, Trula elegans. Yeah, so in the same spot, I was in the railroad and the, the creek. Uh, the river, I can't remember the name of the river, Wadi, Wadi, Wadi River. And I went to look for Mitulas and they are out. And I took samples of three different spots. And only one of these samples that I examined the three of them. In one of my three observations, one didn't have the spores in the ascus. They were not developed yet. But in other two samples that I did, I found the spores, so it is elegance only because the spores are not um, curved like a, like the moon, like the quarter, what's the name? The crescent. So this one were like a bagel, like I, there is one right there, like a French bagel, that's what I call it. I got. Yeah. 
Uh, no, no, I'm so sorry. No baguette. No baguette. French, yeah, baguette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perhaps because it's the beginning of the season, um, later within a few months or maybe weeks, they grow so big and fat, the, the heads of the mitrula. Last year, we found so many of them, and some of them were huge. All right, you're saying like the, the, this orange the part heads. will become really elongated, yes. right? Like a dry racing bigger than a dry raisin and it looked kind of wrinkly. And, and mitrulas grow always where there is a low running body of water. So they can grow in a seepage in the side of a swamp. That's where we find them there. I find them in Smithville in a seepage. Very cool. It's really cool. And they these ones were attached to the moss and to uh, pine needles. No, no pine needles. The moss and the foliage from the white cedar. I found them attached to both of them. That would be worth a trip down to the pine barrens just to see them. Yep. They are also in Batstu. Next to the buildings, I found them there before. Okay, I found another super tiny crust, but it was so beautiful. It's resinicium by color. I don't know why they call it by color, maybe because it shows white and yellow. I think that the creamy part is more mature. And it's very delicate, very, very thin, and it has words that are kind of sparse not too crowded, and the micro is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's like an inch. So it has two or three types of cystidia. This is called halo cystidia, although in this photo, this, the minerals or the incrustations are absent. But I, I was happy because here you can see how is the, the whole structure of the, the cystidia. You will see um, some with the mineral. Here, the mineral concentration is almost in the middle. It's almost invisible. At the middle, you see some kind of yellowish halo thing. That one. Uh, these photos, I cannot show them too big because they are taken with the microscope. So you can, oh, on the left, you can see the, uh-huh. You can see the rounded, the capitate cystidia, and you can see the halo, halo. And you said that halo is mineral? I don't know if it is a liquid or is mineral. I really don't know. Maybe it's, it's a liquid because sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't. And it has this cystidia that has incrustations, crystals. Oh yeah, those are the ones with the crystals. I'm so sorry. I didn't see too many, but and I couldn't have a better photo. So it's like a match, but at the tip is these pointy crystals. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there are other resinicium that are close to this one, but the difference is that cystidia with the crystals on the head. So this is almost like the tip of one of the teeth. It has like fingers like cystidia at the tip and it has this beautiful halo cystidia. And I think it's leptocystidia, the one with the crystals. Oh, that's the tip of the aculeus, as they call it. I couldn't focus. I tried to do the best focus I could be, but that was the best. I couldn't, so not blurry and so not, not too clear. And I got two spores. And the, the apiculus is really prominent. I can't show you better than that, but I saw that. All right. That is the hallowed crust. When I found Mitrula, I also saw we always find this one too. 
Vibrisea foliorum, which is growing on pine needles or oak leaves. Sometimes we find the other one that is grow growing on wood, but this time I only found the foliorum, which means leaves. It's super tiny. And the, the other here are on a leaf. That doesn't look like an oak leaf, but it's on leaf. Okay, and mm -hmm. they are smaller than Mitrula. I couldn't get a better photo of the spores, but they are like needles, very, very long and thin. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, okay. Marcel. Thank you. Okay, I think Dave, you are the next one to email me. Okay, I'm here. Hi, Dave. Hi. Okay. Here's your first one. Yeah, the first one is is something I think I, I showed before. Um, but I couldn't get any spores out of, out of a fruit body. Um, except I, I think I found like one spore by making a smash mount, but it was, it was not a completely mature spore. Um, I returned to the, um, site where, where I made the original collection. There was, this was eight days later. The fruit bodies look exactly the same. They've hardly changed. Um, but they're mature now they're dropping some spores. So I took a few more home. And that's when I found out they were dropping the spores. So I got some pretty good spore photos of um, Gyromitra ancillus, which I believe used to be um, Tiscina perlata. That's, uh, it's been moved into Gyromitra. I think um, Michael Quo actually calls it Gyromitra perlata, um, but it's, it's, it's moved into Gyromitra now, I'm pretty sure. The spores certainly look like jar and mitra spores. And um, I got some pretty good pictures of the spores. Um, so one advantage, Marisol was just saying how it's hard to get good pictures through a microscope. Um, I have this old, excuse me. I'm sorry, did somebody ha have something to add there? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think so. Okay, I thought I heard something. Um, yeah, so I've got this old beat up Bausch and Lomb microscope I bought for fifty dollars from the college where I work, but it's 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 a monocular scope. It's only got one eyepiece, so you get a pretty concentrated um, image, you know, with a camera just pointing through the one the one um, eyepiece. And the key feature here on these spores is what I don't know. Michael Quo calls them. Um, oh, apiculi, I guess. Uh, but I think that's actually a term that is usually used for a basidio spore where it, where it connects to the basidia, basidium. But these are just like ornamentation on each pole. And there's a lookalike species, Gyromitra, I, th I think it's Leucoxantha. And the, the difference is the spores are different. These spores have um, the ornamentation on the poles is shaped like a cone. And, and, it, and when the spores become mature, it gets the, the apex is pretty, is, is fairly acute. So, so it looks pointed. Um, on the other one, Gyromitra leucoxantha, the um, knobs on the poles are, there's like a depression right in the middle of the apex and it it makes it look like there's two horns, one on either side. So this is definitely gyrum, what's you know what's currently called gyromitra ancillus. And I got another picture of a spore too. Um, this this is in um, cotton blue, 
And I, I dilute my cotton blue. Full, I got some full strength cotton blue from John Plischke a few years ago. And, and I, I used it like that for a little while until I realized one day, wow, this stuff is really thick and it's dense. And it's like spores often, the walls collapse when you mount in it. So I started diluting with a fair amount of water. In fact, I think I'm, it's probably like a three to one ratio of water to cotton blue. And that seems to work pretty well. I got one more sport photo here um, that was in actually through my better scope. I actually took this photo through a binocular scope and sometimes you get lucky. And especially if the thing you're trying to photograph is big enough, the um, you can get pretty good resolution um, through one of the eyepieces on a binocular scope. So here, if you can zoom in on that, Luke, it actually doesn't lose a whole lot. Of, of resolution, um, but you can see the uh, oil drops. And a lot of gyromitrospores have, have oil drops. This particular one has three oil drops. So we're losing a little bit of clarity there, but you can see the two smaller oil drops on the right and the left, and the large one in, in the middle. This was in um, Congo Red, which I also dilute. So all I really wanna do is add a little bit of, of um, color to, to highlight, you know, so you can, so it's a little bit easier to see things. But anyway, so that wraps up my gyromitra ancillus um, okay. uh, quest. I'm drying them out and sending them to Alden Darks. Question? Okay. Yes. Don't we supposed to use Congo, but no, sorry, the blue, what's the name for the blue one? Cotton blue. Cotton blue for us call my seats. Yeah, well, that's what they say, but I, I, I get equally oh. good results. Because you see um, the contents with the I, blue. Yeah, well, actually, if you had seen this through the binocular scope with both eyes, it was pretty striking, really. Mm -hmm. if the resolution. But I can really see, good. yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a picture taken through one eyepiece of a binocular scope, and there's still decent resolution. It's because these spores are really big. If you yeah. count that ornamentation, this this thing is probably, you know, like in the mid thirties, uh, the length mid thirties microns. So it's really big. So so the camera knows how to focus, but it's true that the, the see the one in cotton blue was that was through my monocular scope. So so you just get more concentrated focus through, through the single eyepiece, but that picture is pretty good too. You know, you, you can see pretty good um, Pretty good detail there too. Hey so, Dave. Yeah. I have a question. When you're when you're um diluting your uh, dyes, are you doing them in the bottle or are you diluting it on the slide? I have my Congo Red in a bottle that I bought online, and it's I don't know. It's it sounds like it's not very strong, like 0.1 percent or something like that, but it's actually pretty pretty strong. So what I do is I take another little bottle, tiny little bottle, and then I just have some ready-made diluted. And I did the same with the um, cotton blue. I still have the full strength stuff that I got from John Plischke. And I'll just mix a little bit at a time and have it so it's ready to, ready to use. Um, and I, I have these little plastic um, dropper things. Where I can I can pick up just a tiny amount. We got them. Those of us who are in the Northeast Bully Consortium, we got together and got got some supplies a few years ago. And John Plischke got some things for us. One of the things he got were these little plastic uh, droppers, and uh, they work pretty well because you can pick up just a little bit, so you're not wasting very much. But yeah, I I pre dilute. I don't dilute right on the slide. That's too much work, and then. And then if you're putting two drops of something on a slide, then you end up with too much liquid and you have to blot a little bit off, which I thought was probably a bad practice until I talked to um, uh, Rich Kerrigan, Rick Kerrigan one, one day online. And he told me actually that, you know, that's fine that he does that too. You know, if you get too much liquid in, in a mount that you're, you're trying to make. Oh, cool. Look, Mushroom Observer has their logo up. <laughs> Yeah, they got a new logo. It's a yeah, pretty cool logo. And what we're talking, I heard the overheard the conversation before about Mushroom Observer versus INAT. 
The advantage to INAT is you can load pictures in the field out of, out of the phone, which makes no difference to me because I don't even have a phone. Uh, phones don't work in my house. I have no, no cell phone reception at my house. So I, I just use a camera. I would rather take a whole bunch of pictures in the field and put them on my computer anyway, and then sort through them and pick out what the ones I think that are good. And Mushroom Observer, you can upload as many photos as you want. I've got observations with like a dozen or more photos. So this is pretty cool. We had a local Mushroom Club foray the other day from our, um, our club, um, Wyoming Valley Mushroom Club. And one of our new members, her name is Alice, and she brings her little boy. I think he's like four or five. I, I have to ask again how old he is, but he's like really into mushrooms. And he, he found this, this solitary uh, chromosera. I guess that's how you say it. Um, uh, the, the species name is there. It's, a, it's another tongue twister. Uh, but I found these more mature than this one. And once they get a little bit older, they lose a lot of this purple. Um, they retain some of the purple usually on the gills. And I've actually collected this species in pretty much the exact same spot where this was found. And, and it got sent to, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, Jean Lodge, I think Jean Lodge. And, and it was a team really, redhead, Lodge, they were studying, um, uh, making a case for this to be a legitimate genus. This chromos, chromosera, chromosera. Was was it like a like a hygrosophy before? Yes, it was in. It, it was it was it used to be a hygrosophy, I guess, but it grows on wood. Yeah, you know, I think most of the hygrosophies are mycorrhizal, and this thing is pretty clearly a saprobe. It, it grows on logs, mossy logs. Uh, but that's the, the one of the nicest examples I've seen of a really young one that um, that hasn't really expanded and lost its color yet. And it was just one tiny fruit body. The cap must have been, you know, maybe a half a centimeter wide, something like that. And this little um, Seamus, <laughs> Seamus Casey, he he finds all these little things. And boy, it's fun having him on a foray, except every time I get a few steps down the trail, he's back about 20 yards calling me because he found some, some like, you know, Ganoderma or something, right? <laughs> Which is fine. But um, um, he, he spotted this little thing. So that was, that was a pretty good find, I thought. It's not a rare species or anything, but it's, it's a nice example of, of a really young one. And these, these are really slippery too, like, like Gliophorus or Gliophorus. You know, you know how you can hardly pick them up um, because they're so slippery? This, this was like that too. When these guys get a little older, they're not really like that because I, I have found older specimens also. So but I, think I, I think I have another thing that I sent in. Yes, shall I? Oh yeah, this um, this morel. Um, so every year I, I, I make this like three-hour drive down to Maryland because I know this, well, good good morel spot is good good in quotes because it varies by year. Uh, this year I found like eight. <laughs> so, but it's a nice area. It's really nice tulip poplar woods. It's nice walking. There's a friend who I meet down there, and we go and look for look for morels. But this is a pretty good example, I think, of uh, Marcella skeptriformis, which is like, it's like a big um, diminutiva, and it's, it doesn't have so much of a conical cap as it does uh, like an egg-shaped. They describe it as an egg-shaped cap, and that really does look pretty egg-shaped to me. It's a little bit bigger than diminutiva usually as well. The, um, the pits are, are arranged pretty similarly to a diminutiva, they're kind of um, vertically elongated for the most part. Um, so it's a species that you 
I think you could probably find it in New Jersey. Um, I think I found it here in PA in a particularly warm uh, south facing ridge in, in to a poplar woods, but it's mostly associated with the southeast, Virginia, um, North Carolina, maybe even a little further south than that. And that's where that's where the documented finds have been made. And of course, to really be sure with something like this, you have to have it sequenced. So this is one of the species names that comes out of um, that those two competing studies, the Quo et al. and the Cloetz et al. And I think Cloetz won this one. This is a Cloetz species, I believe. I think Co had, Quo had named this thing Marcella virginiana because uh, it's it's they found a lot of it in Virginia. But um, did you eat it? I dried it out. Uh, it's it's so um to sequence or to eat. Uh, I'll probably just eat it. It's it's not a rare species or anything, and I'm not going to pay the money to have it sequenced unless you know. You know, it's kind of a slippery slope with this sequencing thing. You know, I don't want to drain my retirement fund, you know, because I get, you know, pretty much wanting to sequence everything that comes through my hands. Um, but yeah, but this would probably be a reasonably good candidate um, to submit. I think it's still upstairs in the room where, where my dryer is. I, I think it's still in the dryer, actually. I, I hung it. Actually, you know what? I hung it in a, in a window for a few days. And I know when you do that, when I do that with uh, some Amanitas, that's not a good idea. If they dry too slowly, you don't get good um, good sequencing data out of them. So, but yeah, I've, I've got this, you know, it's, it's, it's still upstairs in the attic. So. All right, very cool. Thank you, Dave. Okay. I also found a whole bunch of big yellow morels in my elm spot yesterday, but we'll probably see some more morels. So we, we all know what Marcella Americana looks like. It's it's pretty much, I see it's on the queue here anyway. Yeah, so. I got one right there. Yep, all right. So yeah, I, I, got, I got like 84 of them yesterday in my elm spot. So I have to drive about 45 miles, but it's a really good spot. Okay, that's it, thanks. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> All right, I have a couple here. This is one I found the other day. And let's see. Derek Taylor said it was Sathorellaceae. And then Bethany called it Candoliomyces candolianus. I don't know this mushroom very well. But it was really small. It was really young, so I didn't the know. The Candoliomyces used to be Satharella candoliana. Right. They created a new genus, um, and there's not many species in it. And I, this could be a. I'm not sure though. That that's kind of robust for for that. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Well, it was very small. This was only about an inch and a half tall, so it, it looks stouter than it really is. I think. And you can okay. see the, the gills on it are pure white right now. So it probably wasn't even dropping any spores. So, but it does look like a Sathorella, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's either a currently something in Sathorella or, or um, you know, or maybe it is one of these um, Candelomyces things. Uh, I don't think there's many species put into Candelomyces yet. Um, uh, other than Candelomyces candeliana. Um, but there's also like in the spring you have, um, what is it? Uh, Satharella pseudoverna, um, Satharella blah, 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 grisius. Um, I forget the full name of that one. But there's a, there's a few different Satharellas that you get during morel season. Yeah, I should have done something with it. it. It dried out on me before I really got around to looking at it very closely. You know, Satharellas are really tough. You look at the the um, cystidia, they pretty much, they don't vary a whole lot from species to species, but within a given specimen, you'll see 
you know, a few different types of hymenial cystidia. Um, but then you'll see the same types, you know, in, in the different species. And um, spore size can matter a little bit. Some, some of the saparels have bigger spores than others, but most of them, they, they don't look all that different. I mean, in my experience. All right. Okay, so I found this, Bovista. I'm not sure what species it would have been, but I was excited to find it because I had seen these on occasion, but didn't know what they were. But then over the winter, we did that puffball um, night. And we were talking about these things. I was, in a, I remember seeing them before, but I just saw one the other day. So I was pretty excited. So the Bovistas are the ones that are free rolling, right? Like they detach and then just roll around. Yep. Yep. And they usually have like a shiny papery covering once they're, you know, post mature like this and you find them rolling around sometimes with some string, little strings attached to the bottom. Yeah, this was pretty thin and papery. I don't know if that photo really shows that, but yeah, very kind of, uh, yeah, papery, crumbly, brittle, I guess you could say. Anyway, I thought I'd share that because I was pretty excited to uh, at least know the genus on it based on our taxonomy Tuesdays from the winter. And it was just rolling around out in the woods, blowing in the wind. <laughs> so here in southeastern Pennsylvania, our morel season has not been really that strong. Um, we have not found, I have not found that many um, of the diminutivas very little of them actually, but almost all of the morels I've been finding have been under dying ash trees, which are almost all dead here, unfortunately. So it's kind of bittersweet to find these things. Um, you know, there's still some big ash trees out there that I guess still have a little bit of life in them. They don't have any leaves on them, but the bark has not sloughed off of them yet. And um, that's almost every morel I've found this year has been under there, but I just put this on here just to show off the size of it. This was a big one. That's huge. Yeah. Not Luke, do, do your diminutiva spots have a lot of ground cover that came up early? Yeah, there's a lot of that lesser celadine around here. A ton of the celadine. And yes, it is very puffed up right now. Yeah, I think that, I think when you have those warm spells that are a little too early and the ground cover comes in too fast, I think that maybe has a negative effect. And I don't know if Igor is still there, but Igor mentioned to me about how um, garlic mustard, which is invasive, is problematic um, in terms of coexisting with, with fungi. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, My spot is dying because of that. Well, there's plenty of garlic mustard in southeastern Pennsylvania too, so I'm sure that's not helping. But anyway, I, I had walked right past this too. <laughs> I walked past this and was looking in the other direction. And I circled back around about a half an hour later and passed within three or four feet of it again. And there it was with a bunch more. And I'm a pretty big hand, I'm a pretty big guy. So that's a, that was a nice find there. Did you see it while you were moving? Yeah, yeah, I was looking over. I saw the dead tree and I looked at the, and I, you know, as soon as I see the dead tree, I start scanning the ground close to it. And I mean, it was sticking out like a sore thumb this one it was just i had literally walked within like six feet of it about half an hour earlier but was looking in the other direction yeah <laughs> so okay this thing i don't know what it is i gotta be honest with you i haven't been very seriously mushrooming much this year i just have had really between work and home stuff so i didn't even do anything with it but it was on the underside of a log it was very small that's my palm that they're sitting in you see the lines in my hand so these things are a centimeter or two across and there are these, these little gilled caps i don't know maybe they, some kind of crepidotus growing on hardwood uh, so i guess you didn't figure out the spore print color no again i let them dry out they i put them in my tackle box and didn't get to them and they were so dried out by the time I got back to them, they were pretty much gone. If, if you can scope some some gill material, you might be able to at least confirm or eliminate hohenabilia, which generally has- No color will be wrong. 
Well, don't the Hohenobila, don't they sometimes have the jagged gills? But the color. Well, there's, there's you know, several Hohenobila uh, species. I mean, I don't know them all, all, all that well. I'm just saying that. But I know there is a Crepidotus that is colorful. Could be Crepidotus. You can still uh, the micro. The, the Crepidotus that's colorful is really colorful. It's bright red. Yeah, a Crepidotus is, I mean, it could be a Crepidotus. I mean, there's literally hundreds of Crepidotus. Yeah. You dig in, um, what is it, on MicroWeb, that California site, they have a monograph. I forget who wrote it on Crepidotus, but there's a couple hundred species in that monograph. But that's, you know, that's another thing, though, too. If you can scope a little gill material or something and see a few spores, Crepidotus spores are mainly, you know, round or almost round. There's a few types that have broadly ellipsoid to ellipsoid spores, but most of them have like pretty roundish spores. I'm not sure I forget what Hohenobilia spores look like. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just got, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't, it's not that I think this is a Hohenobilia. Right. That is interesting though, the jagged gills though. How about looking at Lantina? Yeah, that's a uh, good, good suggestion. I'm sorry, what was that one that Nina said? What? Look at Lantina. Oh yeah, Lentinus. yeah. The the thing with lentinus, though, usually they're they're kind of like rigid. This looks like it's kind of soft fleshed, mm -hmm. but that yes, yeah, certainly you know based on the jagged gills. Okay. And the last thing I put in here, I just threw this on here. Um, this is a Facebook group I go on. I just wanted to share it with everyone because I know some other people here use Facebook the Advanced Mushroom Identification and Discussion Group. Um, I threw this on there because Jacob Polk, he's really active on here. So this is one of those mushroom groups. You're not gonna just put it, your average mushroom on here looking for identification. Like they probably, I think everything's curated. I don't think they'll even let it post if you're just looking for like an oyster mushroom confirmation, you know. Um, but he put this long thing on here about telling the difference between Pleurotus dryanus and Pleurotus uh, levis or levis, which I won't read because he put in a really long detailed thing based on DNA. Um, but it was pretty interesting. Um, I think he was actually pointing out that he thinks that virtually everything that we're calling Dryanus is probably levis. But I just wanted to put this up here. How do you spell that name? Which one? Levis? Yeah. L E V I S. Oh, Levis. Oh, okay. Levis. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, re I really was sharing this just because I was on it today reading. And um, for people that are really interested in taxonomy and that were on Facebook, this is a really good group right here Advanced Mushroom Identification and Discussion. Um, it's really driven by Jacob Polk. And uh, he just puts up a tremendous amount of really good information on here. Um, he just put up something about um, Des armillaria now being really confirmed as, uh, or at least more and more accepted by taxonomists in general. You know, there's been that argument for years whether Des armillaria is like a legitimate genus or if it should just all be armillaria. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with the group since everyone here is interested in taxonomy, this is a really strong group to uh, join on Facebook. Okay. Hey, Luke. Yes. You, want, you might want to mention that there's been another development uh, regarding one well-known species of a mushroom, I'd say, Cephirella delineata. It's no longer that. I think it's called uh, Typhrasa gessipina, which is European species. Oh, yeah. Yep, it's on MO too. It's been deprecated. Hmm. The species. Yeah, so we don't have uh, Cephriol delineata is not a real name anymore. It's a uh, it's a ghost. Because the real species name is Typhrasa gossipina, which is a European thing. Yeah. So ours is the same as the European. Yep. Yeah, it's a, it's a saprobe, so it's not, you know real hard to believe, I guess. But there's another species name that was used too. And supposedly there was a difference in spore size. And that was Rugosophala. Yeah. Um, 
But now there's some people seem to believe that the name Ruga uh, Sethral Ruga Sefala was just a very much misapplied name used a long time ago um, to a species that's actually um, a Lacry Maria. So Lacrimari. That, that, that's just another side comment to go along with this delineata because for a long time it was Satharella delineata versus Satharella rugocephala. You know, which one do you have? You have to measure the spores. And when I have measured spores, um, it's sort of over, you know, they often overlap both, both ranges. But anyway, just thought I'd throw that in. Yeah, well, we just have to sequence both versions to see if they're the same. But maybe it doesn't matter anymore. Well, as you sometimes say, Igor, I think with this um, supposed Satharella rugocephala, um, somebody would have to go back and sequence the type specimen, you know, to see exactly what what had been documented back then, because that's that's the hypothesis is that it was just completely misplaced, um, or or the, it was it was compared to Delineata when it really should have been compared to. Um, Lacry Maria, Lac Mabunda, which was a Satharella back back a long time ago. That was what Satharella. Oh, I forget the old species name for that thing. Well, I thought that Lacry Maria, Lacry Mabunda was a very different mushroom, unless my perception of it is wrong. Well, yeah, it seems it seems like there should not have been a mix up because it really doesn't. They don't they don't look all that much alike. But apparently there is a Lacry Maria, not. Lacme mabunda, but a different one that's smaller and has a wrinkled cap. So um, that's there's been some discussion about that on Mushroom Observer. I don't I don't know if anything's been resolved there. But like you often say, somebody would have to go back and sequence the type specimen. That's right. That's where the uh, key to the mysteries are, and uh, just have to throw some money at the problem and hopefully going to solve it. <laughs> yep. Okay, so I have this one from Dorothy, which I'm not sure that she's here tonight. If you're here, Dorothy, just interrupt me. Um, she said, this is her story, she said she found lots of auricularia polytrica on branches in her yard after the rain. She saw something different on a big piece of dead elm bark on the ground. It had a wrinkled shape. When she searched the searched online, she found mushroom experts' description of A. americana, but that's on conifer. It also mentioned A. fusco succinia on hardwood. When she searched, she found Marisol's post on iNaturalist, which had been agreed to by John Plischke. It's a small world. I do not, I did not do spores, but the middle layer is gelatinous, drawing a small specimen. So, I think she is saying that she thinks this is. Auricularia fusco succinia. So it does look a little different than most stuff we see, huh? The sprinkling. Yeah, the one we call um, polytrichia is more purplish and it's kind of whitish and very hairy on the outside. Yeah, there's okay. another there's another new species name as well, um, mm -hmm. Auricularia angiospermarum, that grows on hardwood. But it, in my opinion, it, this one looks like something different. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah, interesting. Cool. The one in the right looks really. Add. Yes, that one. Yep, yep. The underside, huh? Mm -hmm. All right, so. Cool. I want to look at that name again. What's the name? It's right here. Auricula, auricularia. Oh, who's Cochinea? Okay. Who's Cochinea? All right. <laughs> well, thanks, Dorothy. I know you're not here to hear it, but thank you anyway. <laughs> okay, Sue Hopkins. Yes, I am here. Right. So 
this I've been looking for for the last couple of weeks, and it did finally come up in two different places, one where I've seen it before, but this one was a surprise. The one on the left is natural. The one on the right I put there, but you can see it has kind of a, a, a funny stem that goes down into the dirt and it's just a bundle of mycelium. But anyway, the interesting thing is it's the bright yellow color against the moss and the outer surface of the cup is um, this kind of blue greeny color. Uh, it's, it's a very beautiful little mushroom, um, but they're really hard to see. It's only about a half inch across. Uh, I have a couple more pictures. This one, okay. So after I took that picture, I turned over a leaf and there it is on the right when it's older, it, it turns all yellow. And that one even poofed at me some spores. Yellow is the mature? Sorry? Yellow color is the mature one? Yes, the one on the very oh, right that's wow. all yellow is, is what the, like the left to middle to right is oh, mature. It's, it's that gorgeous. Thing. And then it opens out and it, it sometimes has even more blue green when it's younger, but oh. um, very right, it, it's all yellow. And it poops beautiful. Out. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. It's a conifer, conifer associate kind of um, saprophyte, I think. But on rich soils, not like in the pine barrens. <laughs> I think you need to have it a lot colder, or if you're oh. at the end of February, maybe. Oh, I see. Because this is a very early thing, and it also needs to be super wet. You know, like we've oh. had almost well two weeks. Of, of kind of rain almost every day and even snow a couple of mm. two inches of snow on last Saturday. This I saw today and this was in a general area where I've seen it in years past when it has been um, very wet. Uh, Can you say the name again? Uh, Callocypha fulgens. Callocypha fulgens. Fulgens. Oh, okay, okay. The little caps are the biggest one here on this picture on the left is about three quarters of an inch. I, I haven't started carrying my little ruler with me, but um, yeah, okay. Now this picture was taken ten years ago, um, probably well Paul Smith's area, which isn't too far, but you can see it has this funny kind of blue greeny underside with the very yellow yellow interior of the cup. As, as it matures. Very is, beautiful. Is this thing commonly called blue staining cup? Might be. I don't I don't keep track of common names too. Yeah, well. I don't I don't usually either, but I know it's it's uh there's this something called the blue staining cup. Yeah, except it's that it's not blue staining, it is its color. In other words, the stain doesn't happen when you touch it. It is that color naturally. Right. It's well it's, it's staining as opposed to bruising maybe. But what what what's the genus name on that thing? I'll, I'll look it up. Cypher. It's up in the very uh, left hand corner. Luke is waiting. Uh, I yeah. think that's I think that's the thing that they're calling. Yeah, Luke, but Lucy. like I said, it's not bruising. It's not staining. It is the color of the actual little right. cup. When, oh, you know, they might just call it blue stain cup. Sharpshooter user. I did look up the blue staining and it looks like blue stain with the ing at the end is what it is called with a very similar picture like you have Susan. Where is that? Just a Google search for, oh, blue, okay. Okay. for blue staining cup. Yeah, I, I posted this on iNaturalist, but I, I well not this picture, um, the, the one that I took today, um, but I don't know is anybody I don't know if it, you know anybody made a suggestion. I actually didn't look to see if if they called it a um, common name at all. I'm sure they did. They do on the high naturalist, which is kind of annoying. Okay, so that's one thing that I saw today. Oh, and this. Okay, so other spring mushrooms that are fairly common around here is I'm calling this Exidia glandulosa, but it, it looks a little bit disc-like, flat-like. But then we've had up and down rain. So to catch these things when they're poofed out fully is a bit of a trick, but they're very gelatinous and very black and always on alder, which we have a lot of that around the um, streams and um, edges of uh, marshes and that sort of thing. 
and it was it's been I've seen it in about five different places it's very common and and it dries up like you know within hours to just be a black kind of skin on on the older branches and the branches are never bigger than about that big around I, I think there's That's another fun. species name you might consider. I think it's Exidia nigricians, I believe. Um, right. But but I would I would wonder if this was glandulosa also. Glandulosa is usually a little thicker and yeah, that's what I'm. That's like why I'm gold. questioning it because yeah. it's usually more bubbly or you bubbly. Know, yeah. 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 More more top. So I have I have to investigate this more. But whatever this is, it's coming out like crazy this spring in a lot of places. And then the next thing that um, I have here, we, I've, I've run across these now, I think four to in places that I looked last week, they weren't there, but because we've had rain and two inches of snow, this is um, a real gyromitra. I'm calling it esculenta, um, but I, you know, it's another thing I'm gonna have to find a real key for gyromitras. I think it probably is just because ours are, um, associated with conifer. That's what we have mostly around here. Susan, I don't think anybody would call that anything other than Jaramitra esculenta as per the, the status quo on the Ooh. understanding of that. Um, um, the next the picture, more than one species housed under that well, name. the reason I'm sort of questioning it is because when I took this picture and this was a bank of a, a, a road, it's kind of a rough bank that kind of erodes and you know, is, is just scruffy grass and stuff. And um, here, here is the, 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 biggest, the biggest one in that picture. You can see it. And then um, the smaller ones, they're awfully fun to look at and play with. I haven't um, seen these poop spores, but like I said, I know for fact that this group was not, this, this group on this bank was not there last week because I, I drive by, I do roadside identification, you know, but you know why I'm questioning it is it's like one big saddle fungus that's been turned over on the stem and then convoluted. So, so it's another thing that I have to really look at this um, and see if there are other species. Uh, you can't really see it here, but it goes right up almost like a, a semi libra. Anyway, I think there might be a few var varietal names that are currently being applied to Gyromitra esculenta. Yeah, I wondered about that. But even so, whatever it is, there's a lot of them around here. Um, and they're, they're very interesting because they look like little fists coming out of the side of the bank. Or they're just sit sitting there right in the ground. Usually at this point in time, they're on a south facing slope. So this is the false morel, folks. If you get anything that looks like this down your way, don't eat it, okay? What Luke has, and Dave have showed you is the true morel, which will be completely hollow inside, whereas this is kind of fluted and chambered inside. Okay, Luke, so the my sarcosoma report for Jai. I'm only gonna bore you with four tonight. This is the same one that I've been showing the last three weeks, I think the same one that is now poofed out. We've had a lot of wetness and rain. So it's filled up again, not shriveled up in this case. And the other one below it hasn't grown very much, but you see how it's starting to flatten out. And it's, it, should, it should probably have spores, but today was probably too wet to really throw the spores. Um, and I, I, ha I haven't, I didn't pick any of them up today, even though there were a few loose ones. I let the animals kind of eat them but they should be ready for spores about now, even if they- I came in on the end of a discussion or mid discussion that you were having before. And I think it was, it was mentioned that this is actually related to Galliola rufa. Uh, Igor would, I think- Yeah, when I looked at that phylogenetic tree, you know, uh, they were not obviously the same genus, but they're relatives, they're in the same, Superclade or whatever you want to call it, you know, within the Pizaze Eche. Yep. Uh -huh. Okay. Kind of looks like it. Same kind of idea, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mm -hmm. wonder if like the one type evolved along with hardwood litter and the other type evolved along with um, con conifer. Everything, right. I, 
everything I've read on this says it's uh, associated with spruce, and that is what I have where this is. It's a planted stand. Well, I think I'm trying to find out the actual date of, of the planted stand, but they're, they're more Norway spruce. And um, some of them have gotten huge now. I mean, you can see with the quarter how huge this thing has gotten. And I, you know, if, if I poke it, the whole thing is going to just leak out all over the place, but they're quite fun to look at. And then, the, and, and yet, with the next picture, some of them are just starting. It's been a very mixed bag season. Uh, little, this little guy was not there last week. Um, and there were several others that I saw today. In one spot, I think I had, um, last week I had like 84. And in this, today I saw 106, including this little guy. So it's been quite fun. I think right now they're at their maximum growing. And I think now it'll be sort of downhill to the shriveling up and throwing spores and then eventually drying up to nothing. But you know, I've been talking about these for like five weeks uh, since March 31st. So is when I saw the first two, but they're kind of fun to watch. Just, it's a conifer boreal thing. So I don't know if you'll ever see them where you are, but. Nope. Very fun. Yeah, I, I've, you know, when I first saw them, I, I said, this is something, and I thought of the Galliella rufa um, when I saw them, but the colors were reversed. That one has brown in the disc, and I think, as I remember, black around the sides, and this one is reversed. These, these are not showing so black because they're now a little bit mature for the interior disc where the spores form. And, and then the brown skin is kind of like a Chinese Sharpe dog's wrinkled muzzle all around. So anyway, they're a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for the report, so. Yep, yeah. yeah. Okay, Virginia. Okay, this is from New Jersey, from uh, Kingwood Township, New Jersey. This is a, another wish chamber culture on um, bark on river bark. I get a lot on this one single tree, the bark or under it, uh, because her, I guess it's a good spore trap because of the rough bark. So the next picture is bigger, a little bigger here. Um, it looks like cotton candy. Um, it still has a little bit of the peridium and it's stalked. A little bit of the peridium around the bottom yet. It, um, so the next picture. Um, this is the capillitium. If you if you zoom in a little, um, you can see that it has what are called rings and half rings and cogs all around. It's very decorated capillitium, and the spores are just smooth and um, colorless mostly. So that, that's Arceria incarnata. Okay, this is from the same place in Kingwood Township. Now this is a, a moist chamber culture and this is a, a plasmodium that's growing uh, actually across the paper on the bottom. It's a white plasmodium. Um, and so the, ne the next, um, my next one shows the um, pruning body. I'll just do one picture here. So this is Arceria cinerea. It's in, yeah, Arceria cinerea. Um, it, it's in the, it'll be in the next picture, or the next um, observation. Get them, I didn't do it right to get them in the same observation. So this is what it looks like. It's um, it's uh, Arceria cinerea, and it's still it's not. It's kind of a fuzzy picture. I didn't really get a good picture, and it's growing on um, spruce, decaying spruce wood. 
and it uh, it can puff out just like the other, like the first um, Arceria that I showed, the pink one, and it just has clear spores and, and it doesn't have the same picturesque capillation in it. And it's very common. It's one of the most common ones in the Northeast, and I just heard somewhere it's one of the most common ones worldwide. Why is it called carnival candy? Well, remember the other one, the first one, the pink one? Looks like yeah. cotton candy. Yeah, it, it looks like cotton candy on a stem, except that it's less than an eighth of an inch big. Yeah, it's very, very small. Yeah. Like a sixteenth of an inch. Yeah, I don't pay attention to the common names. I don't like them. <laughs> but it does, no, but especially. Fun to, look, fun to look at with a hand lens if you get the last stage of it. Yeah, yeah, when they puff out, um, they do look like cotton candy. <laughs> have, have you tried photographing through a loop? No, I just do it on the, um, the uh, microscope. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes that photographing through a loop works. Uh -huh. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, if you have a loop handy, it might be worth a try. Uh-huh. Sometimes I can get better photos. I don't know. That one was pretty fuzzy, not very clear. Well, I have really little stuff like that. It's, it's, you have to be kind of lucky, I think. Okay. Now, this one, I have no, absolutely no idea what it is, but it was in another um, moist culture and it was acting like a slime mold. The way this is, this is on the plastic side of the container. It crawled up the container to fruit. And they're just a little globular, dark, almost black um, bumps. Um, so, but when I uh, put it on a slide, it didn't look like a, um, a slime mold anymore. <laughs> it has, um, uh, these have septum in it. They have septa and they have tiny, like lemon shaped spores that are clear that are only about three microns long, which is too really kind of small for a slime mold. So it's a, it's a fungus, I guess, but I have no, I don't have any idea what it is. And the brown is, might've been the, the peridium or whatever it's called in a fungus. So I just put it on there because it, it was in my, moist uh, chamber culture and acting it was acting like a like a slime mold right there when it climbed up the uh, side of the uh, container it's interesting that you still got it the fruit though that what i said it's interesting that you still were able to get it to fruit yeah huh? are you still watching it oh it's done that's it's dry okay okay so what you showed was the last stage. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, I don't know what it looked like before because I don't. Sometimes they sit there for a week or two and I don't look at them every day. Um, there was actually there was another slime mold in the same container and there was a plasmodium, um, but the plasmodium wouldn't have anything to do with this uh, thing that looked like a fungus. I don't think it. The plasmodium might have been for the other slime mold. So I just put it in there, but I don't usually, I don't know anything about fungi, really. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Virginia. All right. So that is it for what I have that people emailed me. So we are back to open forum. Does anybody have anything they would like to share? Ah, oh, Bianca. Oh, no. Hi, Luke. Yeah, I've got a couple from today. Uh, hold on just one second. All right, let's see. So I'm uh, walking in a park that I found that blue one uh, before in. The name escapes me at the moment. Uh, it was like blue jean color. 
the heterobacillian. Yeah, right. Uh, and I found, I'll go in order of finds, so I'll just do this one. Let me show it. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So this is what I found. Uh, it is very rubbery. Let me see if I can move to the next one. Here we go, this way. Uh, it also had a little spider nest or a web in there. And then uh, just as I was looking at them, my dog ran by. Oh, that's, that's the general view. So you could see there's um, about three groupings in here. Uh, there's also another one that I saw later on just north. Uh, oh, here it is there. And so my dog ran by and I saw a little cloud. And so I was curious to see whether I could create it myself. So here's a video. You hear my dog in the background too. Can you see the video going? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I blow on it. And a moment later, it pops. It puffs. Okay, there you go. That is so cool that you actually captured that. Ah. Yeah, yeah, I have tried to, to get that on, on a photo. That's really cool. I, I never time it. Yeah, it was actually quite surprising that it wasn't right when I was blowing at it. It was like just a yeah. couple of seconds later. Yeah, it's a it's a delayed reaction. Yeah, I do that on my mushroom walks if I find something that I think will do it. It, it, it always wows people because it's the change in temperature and humidity that, that that's what these ascomycetes do. You can even get morels to do that if they're mature enough. Very cool. Yeah, it was just a sudden thing that I, I happened to see and I'm like, did I see what I, think I saw? So then that was that one. Then I've gotten this one. I found this before. This is on, uh, I think it's a cedar. Do, and I, do you have do you have a name for that little cup, those brown oh, cups? Uh, I think it was what what I have uh, not gotten it before. So let me uh, write check, it down. Check Pazisa phylogena. And if you have the material, if you break a piece off, now you said it was rubbery, but yeah. would it actually be more brittle than rubbery? Maybe yeah. like fragile. Yeah. It was fragile. I wouldn't call it necessarily brittle. Okay. Now, Pazila phylogena, I just found some today. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I'm, I'm waiting for some spores to drop. Um, well, I didn't know you guys. Oh, I'm sorry. I would have grabbed this one. It would have been perfect. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, but it's, if you break a piece off of Pazila phylogena, I'm pretty sure it's phylogena that you will see at least a strip inside the context that's purple. So like ah. the interior context is purple. And sometimes the bottom where, where it breaks off, the point of attachment breaks off, sometimes that'll look purple. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna write that down so I don't forget. I think that's phylogena that does that, I'm pretty sure. And on the underside where it goes into the substrate, right? Yeah, where it's, uh, it's not really a yeah. stock, yeah. but okay. it's just a point yeah. of attachment. So These when you look, break it off, you're actually breaking off and seeing some of the interior context and 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 it might phylogena will often look a little purple and that's right. like the most common little brown cup of, of spring okay yeah dark, there were a bunch dark. so i can go back i know where i found that so cool. how are you going to get spores out of this are you going to turn it upside down because that's not the way it wants to throw them yeah i know I but a lot of times it'll a lot of times i'll get spores I did, I did it uh, on Saturday. I found that pesaiza and I just put it on the slide and the next day I had a good spore print. I didn't yeah, do I anything usually, to it. I usually get spores out of pesaizas. Yeah, yeah but, they, you, but you do turn them upside down, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. I yeah. put it on the slide oh, yeah. and I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Con, concave. The next day. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, concave uh, part, which is the hymenium facing downward. Right, right, right. I know that's right. not the way they, they want to do it. But they're not too particular, I guess, so, because they still fire off their asci, and um, and you okay. get spores. I haven't tried those, it lately. Those gyromitra and psyllis that I showed before, those are really stubborn. 
those take forever to get just a few spores. Okay. Yeah. Good pictures, by the way, Bianca. Thank you, Susan. So the next one, uh, you can see this is, one of them is actually broken open. I didn't do it. I've done it before. I found these at the end of January, at least I thought they were, but I, I didn't write down a name uh, for them. So they were, it looks like it's in um, a cedar. It, it looks like it's, it's not just on the cedar uh, trunk, but actually in the cracked portion of the cedar uh, and nowhere else on that tree. Uh, I, yes, I found it January 28th of, uh, where was it, of this year, of this year. But the, the ones that I found before were actually uh, black uh, coated. Let me see if I could share that one. There we go. And I will reshare this one. So this is the one I found before, also has that kind of light purplish plum colored powder inside, but it looks different than the ones that I found today. So um, let me stop sharing this one. I didn't get a name for this one. I Maybe I forgot to write it down. And let me share the other one again. What were those? The one you just showed? The one I just showed? I have a different picture here. Let me, let me share this one again. And I have comparison. Lycogala uh, epidendrum? Yeah, that's what it looks yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, mature yeah. lycogala. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'd say. It's your fingertip? Glove. Yeah, it's my glove fingertip there. Yeah. I think it's good size. What was it you said? Glycogala. Lycogala. Lycogala. I'll write it on the chat. Perfect. Thank you. Lycogala is uh, not the right color for lycogala epidendrum. I mean, it could be a different lycogala. Oh, okay. Lycogala. I mean, I'm pronouncing. You don't think even when it's old and exploded? All right, so let me stop sharing on this. Sometimes they, they burn with the cold and the color changes. It could, that, yeah, could be, yeah, I hadn't seen those. All right, so these these don't have that same dark coloration, but and it also, all of them have this little kind of like a crack in them, whereas the other ones didn't. But I kind of forced the crack on the previous one to see on the inside. So I don't know, maybe these are older. Well, it's probably unlikely that they were growing now, so you may have, they may have sort of started to grow before the freeze came or matured to this point and maybe froze. Now they're throwing it, they're thawing out and then now they're able to let go of their spores. Is that likely? That's very possible. I'm curious actually, um, let, let me go back to the other one and I don't remember what it was on. Oh no, it looks like the same type of substrate, but it was it was also growing out of like the cracks. So that's curious. Maybe it is the same type. Anyway, so, um, slime molds grow inside the wood. Different species grow inside the wood, and when they're fred ready to fruit, they come out to the surface, and that's why you might see them in cracks. The plasmodium oh. actually lives inside of the wood between the and the wood. So you're you're suggesting this this may be the fruiting bodies of a, a slime mold? It could they it does look like somewhat like a like cogula, yes. Interesting. And okay. um, it's not if you just found them in the winter, they could have well, it's they don't usually survive that well over the winter. Gotcha. You'll, you'll have to excuse me. I'm still pulling ticks off myself from today's uh, for um, <laughs> I had at least 50 of them on my jeans and about five, about 10 on my dog. Yeah. So pardon me. I just found another one. Jean, can you help me out? Let me grab this guy. Thanks. Okay. Um, anyway. All right. So moving on, I also have, uh, let's see if I can get to this one. Um, let me stop share, it'll be easier that way. So you were out today looking for anything fungal? Right, so I'm, I'm not picky, <laughs> so I go find what I can. 
Uh, and I usually, I'm usually walking my dog anyway, and I find things along my way. Let me share this one. I've had something like this before, but I, I thought it was turkey tail. It ended up being um, a false turkey tail. So I'm curious to see whether this is the false one again. Uh, so let's, let me zoom in a bit. Uh, this is just to show the medium that it's growing on. And then, oh, it's not letting me go to the next one. Let me close this. Oh, it's still not letting me. Oops. Here we go. So that's a little bit zoomed in. It has a little bit of a furry top. Uh, and then this is the underside with our little bug friend. Lenzites or Tremedes petulina. There you go. Yep, Tremedes petulina. So this be Lenzites. Yep. And see, it could be several things until you turn it over. The gill polypore. Um, in looks yep. be Lenzites, but like Dave says, I think it's Tremedes now. Yeah, they put it in Tremedes. Yep. Right, Tremedes. But you probably find just as much information on it if you search Lenzites. Lenzites. Yeah, pretty much phonetic with a Z. A Z in there. Thank you. The ID. Yes, got it. Okay, great. And. Um, what well, my great greatest surprise for this evening was this find. So you'll see on the right, it's a very decayed tree. I wish I could tell you what it was, um, but I found a good bounty of these. So it doesn't show as well, but there's a light peach color on the outside. It has almost like a skin tone. Now this shows a little better, it has a nice, almost like a floral touch, but I was surprised to find it's a polypore. So and they see. look fresh. They are fresh. They're rubbery, fresh. And I actually, I took one. So yep, just in they, case. They start up early. Just in Bad, case if you're going to do something that, what is it? Um, uh, used to be pol polyparous baddius, but it's. Um, it's, it's it, it was. was it, it was royal porous baddius, I think, for a while. And now it's. Sir, is it Cereoporus? Pisipes. Oh, Pisipes, right. Pisipes baddies. Pisipes baddies. Yep, that's what it is. How do you they spell start that? Up early. You going to put that in the chat? Please, please. Yeah, I got I've never it. Even heard of that. Yes, yeah, so I have a couple more of those the pictures of this. Uh, so it's this one. Then uh, again, from a top down view of the multiples, different sizes, different ages, it seems. A uh, couple of new ones over here on the top right. And then it has, I pulled this one off and it has this root and you'll notice what you see there, those are actually droplets of water holding on to that, that uh, edge, the, the root. I also uh, scratched the surface and there was no color. And that's compared to my hand. You know, what's funny is I was just looking at these over the weekend. I led a mushroom walk here in Bucks County and we were looking at these, but we were looking at fruiting bodies from last year that were still there. Hard, you know, half rotted, but still easily to identify. They had persisted. So here they are starting to grow already and they'll probably still be there next spring. Yeah, those are pretty well advanced too for this early. They, that, these must have started in like maybe even like early April or March or something. How far south was this? This is Freehold. Which no, is, the, is that, so, is that um, in southern New Jersey? I really want to say central because it's just north of 195 if that helps you. Um. Well, kind of, I guess. <laughs> I, okay. I don't know Jersey all that well, really, but um, but that, but at any rate, even if it was in southern Jersey, that would, that's kind of um, surprising to find them. This maybe maybe they started last fall, 
and went dormant over the winter and continued to grow. I wonder if they do that. But it's curious to see these really tiny ones up in the top right. Let me see if I can zoom in a bit yeah. over here. Yeah, these really tiny ones here. Oh, I see. Up in the upper right, by, there's there's like a pair of them. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So those... They're still actively growing. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, these all look like they're actively growing. I just wonder how how long they, you know, how long ago they started. But those really little guys, they look like probably really new ones. Right, yeah. yeah. Within the last few weeks, let's say. Sure. You see. Oh, that's interesting. That's quite a good find. That's quite exciting, really. Yes, I was very excited for sure. I yeah, love yeah. Nice you won't picture. forget it either. <laughs> yes, I won't. I know where they are. <laughs> well, you. but you won't forget it because you spent time looking at them and they have the black foot. It was kind of a smooth undersurface, tiny Leather. I actually did the little bit of, I remembered, uh, you're allowed to taste a touch of them as long as you spit them out. They're a little bit of bitter in taste, very, very strong bitter. Uh, but mm -hmm. the smell is very mushroomy, like it's uh, almost made me drool. <laughs> 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 but I'm sure it's not good to eat. It's very bitter. I don't know, maybe well, if I could. Um, probably too tough. No, no, they're they're here. I'll, I'm bending it, see? Well, I know, but that still looks a little tough. And shoe leather too. <laughs> oh, I don't mind. <laughs> I would try it if you're telling me I could eat it. <laughs> you'll you'll find better stuff to eat than that for sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the morels. That's right. it. Thanks, Bianca. Oh. Hey, Lila, you are up. All right. Uh, All right, so this one is actually not a mushroom, it's a fly mold. And I think it's the first time I've ever seen it was um, quite a silvery protrusion on the side of a well decayed log. Um, and there are actually two of them little, almost the size of a half dollar, maybe not quite that big. And very shiny silver color. And I went and touched the one on the right and it fell right off the log and it broke. And it's full of the spore mass just looks like um, chocolate dark chocolate and it was pretty pretty interesting I took it home and uh, set it on my steps and it eventually just totally dissolved um, into a, a mass of spores but I didn't take a picture of that if you put them under a microscope the uh, reticularia has um, interesting looking spores it they have reticulate spores. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I thought you would know something about it, Virginia. Well, I've never collected that. I've never seen it. So. First thing, okay. I know the name. But yes. it is a slime mold, right? Yeah, it is. I know the name. This one has to find it in the book. I just cannot remember. It's it it like, oh, like a garden or something like that. It's something like a perdum. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, reticulate. Reticularia like a purdon. Yeah, yes, that's the name. Oh, okay, so it's got yeah, the, the name. Yep. yep. And it's a false puffball, but it, it puffs like a puffball. You touch it and those spores did did um, smoke out. Mm. So, but yeah, and as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, wow, that's something different. I haven't seen that. And sometimes it's so beautiful. It has a silver look, almost yeah. like the color of a bullet, shiny. Yeah, yeah, it was quite, yeah, this yep. photo doesn't really do it justice. Uh, no, that's not, yeah, it's kind of gray bullet color, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was really neat, so. And sometimes by gravity, it's like hanging. It's like, a, it's too heavy to be where it is, and it's like concentrated at the bottom like a belly, like a big uh -huh. belly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
might be a little bit down here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was, oh, and you can see up here, it's starting to lose its uh, mm -hmm. skin covering. Um, but yeah, I just barely touched the one and it, and it came right off in my hand and it was, they're ready, ready to go. It has a bigger size in comparison to other slime molds. Oh yeah, yeah. This yeah, is, yeah. Yep. yeah, almost the size of a half dollar, definitely. Yeah, you can see it more easily, not like the tiny ones that are only about a millimeter <laughs> tall. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you don't don't need a, a lens to see this one. So <laughs> so that was that was a, a new find. All right, and the other one is just um, This one, which are the rhizomorphs, I think, of, of one of the honey mushrooms. It was just beautiful. The log was really nicely covered. If I'm not wrong, I think the only one that does that is Armillaria meldea. That's what I understand, unless somebody knows something else. That's the only thing I've ever actually heard yeah. it associated with. Armillaria meldea. Meldea. Yeah. Yeah, same, yeah. same here. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, I didn't know it was just one of them. Okay. Except that that's a species complex, so we don't know that all of the seven species don't do that. That's a question for Tom Voke if anybody's in touch with him. Oh. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, those things are always uh, fun to find. Picture. Thank you. Uh, pull them off, they're very stiff and, uh, and brittle. And, uh, and it was probably an elm tree, right? Not necessarily. I, I have uh, found these in many types of woods. I think yeah, it's usually oak with uh, armillaria melia. And when I've seen the rhizomorphs, I, it's usually on oak. Yeah, it's probably oak or tulip poplar, I guess, based on the woods. But anyway, that was. That was just an attractive find. So that was it for me. Thanks, Lila. Bianca, I send you a private message. Thank you, Maricel. I have actually heard that multiple times before. <laughs> be quiet. Yes. Don't thank say you. anything, please. <laughs> no, I would. I would want to go with somebody anyway, so I oh, wouldn't okay. want to be just by myself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What? Does anybody else have anything they want to share? Actually, go ahead. Somebody. Yeah. I had one other uh, mushroom that I forgot to potentially show. It doesn't have as many pictures, but I think it is quite interesting. If you're interested. Go for it. Sure. Let me close this. And this one. Okay. And so the first one I will share. Where's the, oh. So the first picture is a small bud of what I'm going to show next. It was also on this same uh, log. Um, and the next the one is this guy. Right. So you can see from the top. Yep. And then underneath, it's not just a stem or not a direct connection to it, but it almost looks like a bulbous uh, attachment. Uh, and here's the in-between. Cereoporus squamosus. Can someone chat me that, please? AKA the dryad saddle or pheasant back. Oh, I've heard of this before. Mm -hmm. so or the old name Polyporus squamosus. And cereoporus, did you guys say? Yeah, cereoporus. Yes. And that's it. <laughs> when they're very young, I hear they're edible, but I you gotta cook them a lot. I don't even think that's young enough. Oh, so like this a little bit? Well, <laughs> even a bite, is it? <laughs> it's about the size of a quarter. 
Luke, have you ever tried to cook this? I think you described it once, didn't you? Yeah, I actually see some like a week or two ago. I cut them like really thin strips and fried them until they were super crispy. It didn't taste like anything but like crispy fried <laughs> chips. Dave says he likes to pickle them though, or like cold marinate them. No, so I've never done that, but I, 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 there used to be a member of our local club who brought some once to a meeting that he made, and he just had very thin slices that he had cold marinated, and um, I, he said he didn't even really cook them all that much, if at all. Um, but I mean, what he had was really good. It was it was very tasty and had nice texture. So I've never tried to do it myself though. I mean, I have tried cooking them. I wasn't all that impressed, really. So they taste kind of like watermelon rind, you know, unless you do something to change change the flavor. Yeah, like I said, when I was when I like fry them up, they're like so crispy and salty at that point. I think the flavor is pretty much you're just tasting, you know, more texture and salt than anything. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else have anything? There was a lecture this Friday night. Anybody saw that? I'll pull the information up really quickly. Elsa's a really good mycologist, by the way. Yeah, she came out a couple of years ago, two or three years ago now, and did a uh, talk for us on conservation. That was a really good talk. So, yeah, Elsa Falinga who's a mycologist in California, and she's super active with all kinds of stuff in conservation and um, describing species. I think it says here she's described 22 species as new for California. Um, but she's doing a talk this Friday at 7 p.m. on fascinating spores, focus on spores, the role in life of a mushroom, and the correlations between spore characters and fungal lifestyles and dispersals with an emphasis on all things that we don't know. And there is a note here that says this will not be recorded. So that must be for her request that this is not being recorded. So if you wanna see it, you have to tune in on Friday at seven. And I sent that out last night, uh, yesterday evening, the link for that. She, she was lead mycologist at NEMF, I think 2012 maybe in East Strasburg. So, Oh, yeah, I remember that. That was the first NIF I went to. And I went to one of her talks and it was, uh, or I was in a talk, that's right, where she was conversing. I remember being impressed with her stuff. She also visited our club in 2009, I think, if anybody remembers. That was like eons ago. Yeah, it does, it does seem like eons ago. We're all packed in that little tiny Igor, room, right? Time, time is a relative thing, Igor. <laughs> Tell me about it. We were, we were packed like sardines in that little can at that nature center, which seems like a, uh, <laughs> at this point, seems crazy, right? <laughs> that couldn't have been 2009, because I'm pretty sure I was there. And I don't think I was around. No, she, she was. Again recently. No, 2018 19. or 19. Yeah, no, 2009, yeah. she actually was invited to come to NJMA and give us a lecture. I mean, that was a very long time ago. It was over a decade ago. So very few people remember that. But I remember she came like two or three years ago. Yeah, that, I remember that. That's one. the yeah. one I remember. Maybe. That, that yeah. I should remember probably because I'd never went to the lecture. We so. went to a center. I cannot remember what, what place was. So brown wooden building. Yeah, yeah. Somerset County uh, Environmental yeah. Ed Center. Yeah, in Bernardsville. Yeah. Oh, okay. and I, Basking and Ridge. Basking Ridge, right. And I yeah, rented Basking. I rented the wrong room. I was supposed to rent the nice big one and I got the little tiny one. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> Live and learn, right? <laughs> it, it worked out. It was a good talk. That was, yeah. So anyway, she's speaking this Friday. Um, so if you can, should definitely join in. Okay, anybody else have anything they would like to uh, share or anything before we go? Before we go, actually, I wanted to ask, uh, 
last week you mentioned about uh, potential locations to offer. Uh, I wasn't sure where to put that. So I, I wrote in the text in the chat box, uh, Turkey Swamp, but actually the place that I was today, even though it is tick filled, uh, it was quite like quite spacious, more spacious than I expected. And uh, in the summer, it would, I'm sure we'll have plenty of different types of mushrooms. So where would I offer that information? Um, well, is I, I can see John Burkhart is here. Is Nina with you, John? Oh, yeah, I see Nina poking her head in there. She's the one who probably would want to know that information the most. Sure, Nina. So the place that I'm referring to is just north of Turkey Swamp. So Turkey Swamp is its own park and has trails. But the place that I was today was um, uh, just north of it. There's a big open field that looks like it's been mowed, but next to it is completely looks like uh, barely touched uh, by humans uh, space. And I followed a deer trail actually within it or a hunter's trail. What town are you in, Bianca? Freehold. Oh, Freehold. Okay. And you use permetrin on your clothes and your shoes? I didn't today. I didn't expect to have such oh a bounty. Gosh. But yes, I will definitely be using whether DEET or whatnot yeah. to prevent this. A turkey swamp is in Jackson Township, isn't it? It is, yes. Oh, so so this Freehold's just next to it. The park you went to was in Freehold or Jackson Township? I guess it's just next to it. So it would be, I think, just north of Jackson Township or potentially just west of Freehold, if that helps. Okay. It could be more specific. If you'd like, I can give you the, uh, the marker for the parking lot in uh, coordinate form. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, if, okay. Uh, yeah, you'll have to get um yeah I, I send it to i guess you can send it to luke and then he'll send it to me that would do okay is that okay luke yeah i can put it in the chat now i'm just gonna find it real quick do that oh okay are you preparing the 4a schedule now or have you already got oh, i already did it i already did back in february yeah, that's what I thought. It, it yeah. is published, right? Or it's, it's, however you guys do it now? Yeah, we have 19 forays. We're, we're we're the I don't know where the chat is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we got uh, Yeah? Uh, Bianca, I'll just email you right now and copy Nina on it so you guys will just have each other's address. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. Yeah, that'd be good. It's, in the, uh, it's in the chat now, if that helps. But yes, I don't mind. Okay. And so, it does look like Freehold Township. Okay. Okay. I just emailed both of you in the same email. Oh, okay. Thank you. What what you about, uh, the trouble with a lot of places is you have to have enough parking. So, yeah. Yeah, this has a a parking uh it's just a rock parking lot for maybe and you could park in the grass also next to it so it's it should have enough i mean for maybe like 30 cars oh well, that's funny <laughs> it's called the Masquan river linear park okay. well i'll check it out all right awesome so it kind of seems like we're wrapping up here. So I guess I will see everyone next week, right? Thank you so much, Luke. All right, you're welcome. Thanks everyone for coming tonight and good luck mushrooming this week. Yeah, thank you. All right, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.